Hello, and welcome to another episode of Healthy Perspectives. My name is Vernon Solomon. The availability of suitable facilities and qualified medical personnel to provide specialized care for babies is extremely important. In fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics states that the availability of neonatal intensive care has improved outcomes for high-risk infants, including those born preterm or with serious medical or surgical conditions. A neonatal intensive care unit, or NICU, is an intensive care unit specializing in the care of ill or premature newborn infants. Unfortunately, NICUs are still non-existent in some parts of the world. Fortunately, here in Antigua, that's not the case. Mount St. John's Medical Center is equipped with the NICU, which is staffed and managed by qualified healthcare professionals under the direction of the head of the pediatric department, Dr. Siobhan Bell Jarvis. In this episode, we will be speaking with Dr. Richardson, consultant pediatrician at Mount St. John's, and Sister Zena Knight Barnes, NICU unit manager, in an effort to highlight the standardized services provided by NICUs worldwide, including there at Mount St. John's Medical Center. We will examine how the services NICUs provide can mean the difference between life and death for your newborn. Dr. Rick Millis, medical physiologist at the American University of Antigua College of Medicine. For this episode of Healthy Perspectives, we're going to look at the neonatal intensive care unit at Mount St. John's Hospital in Antigua here. And my guests are Dr. Claudine Richardson and Sister Zena Knight Barnes. Welcome. Thank you. Dr. Richardson, I understand you're the consultant pediatrician at the neonatal intensive care unit. We call that a NICU, don't we? Yes, we do. So tell us what a NICU is. So uh, NICU is basically an intensive care unit or ICU for ill babies. Mm -hmm. These babies can be premature and up to term babies. They can be admitted at birth and up to 28 days of life, which is considered the neonatal period. At Mount St. John's Medical Center, in the NICU, we admit not only ill babies, but babies that need just a little bit more than routine care, even though they are stable. This NICU unit that we have here, how does it compare to other NICU units worldwide? I mean, do they have the same capabilities, the same uh, equipment? How does that work? So neonatal units are categorized with different levels of care. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to follow the American Academy of Pediatric Grading System, and that is graded from levels one to level four. Level one being the lowest level with the basic amount of care, and level four being the subspecialty care. We at Mount St. John's, we are a level three um, neonatal unit. And so that means we are capable of life support, we are also capable of managing babies less than 32 weeks gestation, babies who are less than 1,500 grams. We are also capable of providing respiratory support, and that can be in the form of what we call CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure, and also mechanical ventilation. We also have available to us pediatric, pediatric surgical services as well as radiological support, so that makes us a level three unit. I see. Well, you have your hands full there with all of that equipment and all that responsibility. Yes, Tell me, um, uh, when a baby is born, how does a baby get admitted to the NICU? I mean, how do you determine that this baby has a condition that qualifies for NICU care? So there are several reasons why a baby can be admitted to the NICU. 
Um, at the hospital, we do have a standardized list, so this makes it quite easy for us to identify which babies. Um, we need to look at the maternal risk factors as well, because that can contribute to if the baby requires admission or not. So the cases that we tend to admit can be cases of prematurity, babies who have respiratory distress, babies who are born to mothers um, who have diabetes, babies who have infections or may be at risk for infections, babies who may have experienced asphyxia. Um, there are cases where may, we may have to admit um, multiples like twins or triplets like we had last year. We may admit babies who are greater than 4,000 grams, which is about nine pounds, and babies who are small for age as well. So some of these conditions that you've talked about, obviously most of them are related to prematurity. Are all the babies premature who come in? No, not all the babies are premature. Mm -hmm. So at the hospital, we admit about, um, we have about 1,100 deliveries per year at the hospital. And we admit 30% of those cases, so that comes out to about 300 to 350 um, babies per year that are admitted. 80% of those cases are term babies, and 20% are premature babies. I see. So term baby means that the mother has carried them For to 13, the normal nine, yes, yes. basically nine months. Yes. Very interesting. Sister, tell us a little bit about uh, what your role is there. Well, I am the manager. Okay. And um, although I manage the unit, I like to get my hands involved. I like to care for the babies also. Um, a manager is supposed to be able to not only lead her nurses, but she's supposed to be able to know what's going on on the floor. Cases that come in, she's supposed to be able to at least be able to take care of the babies also. And so um, my, my duties are twofold. I've got two hats, I'm a nurse and I'm a manager. Obviously you need experts in care of these neonates, these newborns. So 24 hours a day, do you, obviously one doctor can't be there 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So do you have a group staff that you can call upon, experts that are available around the clock for, um, for consulting? Well, the doctors, they are the ones that basically are in charge of um, the medical care for the premature babies. And we have nurses who, are, who work eight hour shifts. Um, 7 to 3, 3 to 11, and 11 to 7. So 24 hours a day, we've got somebody who, who's there to take care of the babies. If we meet with emergencies or some, you know, some situation that needs um, a little, you know, extra care, then the doctors are always on call um, and we can contact them. What about the, the parents? Tell us, it must be quite a shock for parents very often to see a baby who's premature and very small, and their life is at risk, and I, many of them probably don't expect that. When a woman gets pregnant, she expects to take her baby through to 40 weeks. Yes. She is never prepared for a baby coming before time. And when many of our parents come into the units, and first of all, they're taken aback by these small human beings housed in glass isolates, hooked up to machines and all the tubings and the machines blaring, it is somewhat frightening for many parents. And our duty as healthcare professionals is first of all, to calm the patients, the parents' fears and, and show them, be sympathetic and empathetic at the same time, if we can be that way, and uh, um, deliver care to the babies. As a nurse, you must be responsible for feeding the babies. How do these babies get fed? Babies, well, the feeding of the baby is dependent on the diagnosis. Um, more often, they eat by mouth. And if the baby is premature, um, for whatever reason or other, we insert, or doctors would insert, <laughs> they make the orders to insert a tube, whether, whether it's through the mouth or through the nostril. A feeding tube. A feeding tube. Yes. And the baby is fed via those two roots. Are the mothers ever involved in the feeding of the babies? Do that's the mothers one of, come in and do that's have an one of the duties. That? One of the duties uh -huh. that, um, of the NICU department is to involve parents in the care of their babies. 
Um, you have to get them accustomed to caring for these tiny creatures, for want of a better <laughs> connotation. Um, it, it, it helps to allay or alleviate the, you know, the apprehensions that these small babies, you know, it's frightening for them. And if we get the parents involved in feeding, diaper changing, and touching and stroking their babies, talking to them, then it helps to calm them. It's, it's a healing process, not only for parents, but for babies also. So the parents can come and actually uh, hold the baby sometimes yes, and they can. feed it's, them? Depending on, it depends on yes. the age of the baby and the condition, the diagnosis, you know. Parents are allowed to hold the babies. And what about transitioning these babies to home? It must be very satisfying to have a successful transition to home. Yes, it is. Yes, and it do you really ever get a is. chance to see these babies as they we see them as we, they grow? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, last year in November, twelfth mm -hmm. to the eighteenth, was our first celebration of Prematurity Week, oh. and uh, we had this drive where we sent messages to the parents of the past premature babies that they'd bring us pictures of before and after pictures of the babies when they were in the NICU department. And many of them are now walking and talking and kicking up a storm. And um, one of the activities that we had planned last year was a get together for the parents and the children of the, um, the NICU department, you know, or NICU hero, or tiny heroes, or success stories. And it was rewarding to see these little people coming in and talking and just, you know, just running around the place. We really, really had a ball. Wonderful. That's very satisfying. So tell me, Dr. Richardson, uh, if I'm an expectant parent, uh, how do I prepare myself for the possibility that my child, my newborn, may have to uh, require uh, NICU care? For the expectant parents, um, there should be open communication from the beginning once you know that you're pregnant, open communication between yourselves and your physicians and all midwives that are responsible for your care. They can alert you to the different risk factors that would make you like a high risk pregnancy. For example, do you have a chronic illness like hypertension or diabetes or any chronic infections? Um, like HIV or syphilis, and that would indicate that you may be at a higher risk of um, delivery and your child might need admission to NICU. You can also become familiarized with our NICU services that we have. And uh, at Mount St. John's Medical Center, we are capable of caring for babies who are at least 26 weeks gestation and 650 grams and over. So clarify that for the audience now. 26 weeks of gestation. 26 weeks. Is and just bearing in mind that a normal pregnancy is what can trimester? go up to 40 weeks. Ah, okay. Right? And the 650 grams, that's about one and a half pounds. So we're capable of taking care of those babies. Um, our success stories in terms of our lowest gestational age mm -hmm. um, has been 25 weeks. And our lowest surviving prem baby has been 696 grams, which is, again, about one and a half pounds. Virtually all of these babies survive and go on and become healthy children. Yes. And they come back for preemie week. week. <laughs> how, wonderful, how wonderful is that? That's great. So any special advice you can give to expectant parents about how to you know manage a pregnancy to ensure that they avoid maybe some of the risk factors so that they don't have a baby that requires NICU care. Okay, it all starts before you get pregnant. Great. So pre-pregnancy counseling is very important because it can help to identify some of the risk factors and particularly those risk factors that are modifiable then you have time to change those. Well, so what are some of those modifiable risk factors? For example, smoking. Smoking. Mm -hmm. Clearly. Alcohol. If you're obese, then mm -hmm. you can lose weight. If you have any chronic Before illnesses. Before you get pregnant, you should lose, lose weight, weight, right? Yes. If you have any chronic illnesses, make sure that you can get them under control. So make sure your diabetes is under control. Make sure your high blood pressure is under control. So things like that, you can prepare yourself for pregnancy. And then once you're pregnant now, 
it is advised that you start to seek medical attention before 12 weeks of pregnancy, which is the first trimester. You should become registered in the district clinic mm -hmm. and you can seek medical attention there through the midwives or the physicians, or you can see your private obstetrician or private physicians. Once you have your antenatal care on board, you must follow all instructions that are given to you. Make sure you have your antenatal screening done. Make sure you're taking your prenatal vitamins. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're trying to keep your chronic illness under control, trying to maintain a healthy lifestyle, getting your ultrasounds done. And once you follow these guidelines, then you can somewhat expect a best, the best outcome for your baby. Sister Barnes. Is there a follow-up procedure for these critically ill babies when they're discharged home with their parents to make sure they get proper care and supplies they need? Well, yes, there is. As we stated earlier, babies who are discharged will be seen at the pediatric outpatient department. Um, they'd make an appointment, and um, depending on their diagnosis, what the illness was, um, they'd be seen and followed up with Dr. Richardson and her team and then referred to the district clinics where they'd have their routine vaccinations done. Um, if they have to be seen by the ENT specialists or um, the ophthalmologist for their screenings, those things are carried out for the babies. Wonderful. So it sounds like you have a very good protocol for that. Yes, we do. This has been really enlightening for the audience, I'm sure, and very interesting. It seems like you to have the most satisfying and interesting jobs in all of Antigua. Yes, we do. Yes, we so do. <laughs> we, we thank you for all the hard work that you do. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you for having us. Asthma is a fatal disease with serious consequences, especially during an asthma attack. Knowing what to do in this situation can be crucial to saving your life. First, when having an asthma attack, stay calm and take deep breaths while standing straight up. Second, take your reliever or rescue inhaler immediately and take one or two puffs. Continue to breathe steadily. Third, sit down and ensure any tight clothing is loosened. However, do not lie down. If there is not immediate improvement, take another one or two puffs of your reliever or rescue inhaler. If your symptoms do not improve in a few minutes, call emergency services or go to your nearest hospital. Do not wait until it's too late. Control your asthma. Do not let it control you. This message was brought to you by American University of Antigua College of Medicine Asthma League. Some factors that can place a baby at high risk and increase the chances of being admitted to the NICU are being born at gestational age of less than 37 weeks or more than 42 weeks, a birth weight less than 5 pounds 8 ounces or over 8 pounds 13 ounces, Resuscitation or transfusions in the delivery room may have an impact. Birth defects, respiratory distress, infections, seizures, or even low blood sugar. This information is not to scare you, but is aimed to help you understand why a baby may need to be in the NICU. If you are an expectant mother, be sure to speak with your doctor about any concerns you may have. Take care of yourselves. We thank you for spending some time with us and for allowing us to share healthy perspectives with you. Be well, Antigua and Barbuda, and may your perspective always be a healthy one. When it comes to your health, there are many options, but which do you choose? Your choice is going to be determined largely by your view on what being healthy really is. We at AUA place a high degree of importance on health and education, so we've created this program to provide you with solid information that would facilitate your decisions regarding your health. Join us for AUA's Healthy Perspectives, hosted by Vernon Solomon of the American University of Antigua.